<laughs> I don't know. You, you're, you're too busy. Okay, uh, can we declare the meeting open to the public? Yeah, great. Members, welcome to the 13th meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Can I advise members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings and online? However, there could be a slight delay in moving between any private and public sessions, so please be patient. Can I advise that those in the public gallery are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are on airplane mode and all devices are muted. Also connect to assembly Wi-Fi. Details are in the gallery rules uh, and it is not permitted at any time to record or photograph proceedings of this meeting. We will proceed as follows. Apologies. Can I advise members that we have received apologies from Diane Forsyth, MLA, and Colin Gilder, new MLA. And members, on behalf of the committee, uh, can I extend my sincerest condolences to Colm and the wider Gildernew family on the tragic loss of his nef nephew, uh, Fierkra. Uh, and members, um, uh, it is a very difficult time for any family, uh, and I'm sure all members have the Gildernew uh, family in their thoughts at this time. Uh, can I seek agreement to send a formal letter of condolence on behalf of the committee to Colm and to the wider Gildernew family? Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. Okay, members, can I refer members to the pack for a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of May uh, at uh, page 7 in your pack? Can I seek agreement? Read. 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 Okay. I refer members to a correspondence dated the 30th of May 2024 from Neil Gibson, Accounting Officer for the Department of Finance. Following up on matters raised during the evidence session on public procurement in Northern Ireland, can I advise members that this correspondence has been shared with the Northern Ireland Audit Office uh, uh, for consideration and inclusion in the report? Can I seek agreement to note the correspondence? Eight. Okay, members. Can I refer members to correspondence dated 31st of May 2024 from the Committee for Education confirming that Previous correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee has been noted, and the Committee have agreed to seek an informal briefing from the Northern Ireland Audit Office on their work on closing the GAP report and other education matters. Uh, members agreed to note the correspondence? Agreed. Okay, members, thank you. Uh, can I ask members if they have any relevant declaration of interest to declare at this point? Can I just, yeah, can I just come on briefly on that? Yes, Patrick. Um, just Obviously, I've mentioned before, but I chair the old party group mental health, so just want to put that for clarity. Thank you, Patrick. At least they, my, my wife works for EA, just to declare. Okay, chair. Uh, thank you, David. Okay, members, uh, agenda item seven, MOR, closing the gap, the social deprivation and links to educational attainment evidence session. Members are now, we are now going into closed session to receive a preparatory briefing ahead of the commencement of the evidence session. Um, so can we allow a few moments uh, for... Committee Room 30, signed. Okay, uh, members, can I take this opportunity to welcome to the meeting Dr. Mark Brown, the Accounting Officer, uh, or other known as the Permanent Secretary for the Department of Education, Lindsay Farrell, uh, Deputy Secretary for Education Policy and Children's Services, and Peter Hutchinson, Director for Raising Aspirations, Supporting Learning and Empowering Improvement, and also welcome Stuart and Julie uh, from the TOA. You're very welcome as well. Um, okay. Uh, Dr. Brown, Ms. Farrell and Mr. Hutchinson, you're very welcome to the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, thanks for taking the time to meet with us today and for being here. Uh, we uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm sure you've got some indication as to why you've been invited before the committee today. Um, you'll, have, you'll understand that there's a concern uh, that the responses provided uh, in the MOR uh, do not provide sufficiently clear explanations uh, of the actions that the Department for Education has taken or will take to implement the accepted recommendations in the committee's report. Uh, the responses, for instance, are too long and include information that is not in any way relevant to the recommendations. 
Uh, and in many cases, the responses refer to actions and initiatives that actually predate the recommendation, uh, not actions that have been taken as a response to the report. The responses provided do not describe how and by when the accepted recommendations will be implemented, and none of the responses provide details on when actions will be completed, and few of any indicate how outcomes will be achieved. Responses should be clear, direct and succinct, and unfortunately, on this occasion, they're anything but. So for that reason, we have asked for you to come back before this committee. And this is a signal not just to the Department of Education, but every department, that if we do not receive responses that are satisfactory or in direct response to what we've requested, then we will be calling back to the committee to answer our concerns. The responses, in short, do not comply with the relevant guidance from the Department of Finance contained in DAO 3-21. And again, I do appreciate your attendance, but I hope that you'll understand our concern and the reasons as to why we've asked for you uh, to be with us today. So, if you would like to if you had anything to add, Mr. Dr. Brown. Uh, Sir Nature, thanks very much for the invitation to attend. I'm disappointed, I have to say, um, that that is the view of the committee. Um, and we're very happy to uh, try and address the points that you have made. Um, it, it would always be our intention to set out very clearly. And believe me, I am uh, very supportive of um, brevity. Um, in terms of, of, of what we are doing as a department, because this is an area in which we are extremely active and have been for a long period of time uh, and in which we continue to be active. It's also an area in which we have a whole range of existing uh, uh, programmes which are very much valued by schools, uh, but which we are seeking to improve and uh, update. Um, and we'll, we'll be happy to take you into the detail of that. Sure, I have I had a whole range of opening remarks. I actually don't propose to go into those. I'm happy to move straight into questions so we can give the committee the maximum time to explore the particular <coughs> issues that you've raised and for us to, to respond on that. And we have quite a number of questions, uh, Dr. Brown, and uh, the various members of the committee will direct them to yourselves shortly. Uh, you know, I don't understand why you'd be disappointed because I've laid out very clearly in my opening remarks and welcoming you to the committee the reason why you have been invited back. And the reality is that the work of this committee is important. We produce reports with the support of the Northern Ireland Audit Office who do outstanding work. Uh, and when we make recommendations, we expect those recommendations to be adhered to and at least responded to. Uh, and in the responses that we have received, I don't believe it is in any way satisfactory. So this is not just about the Department of Education. That will be the signal from this committee to every department uh, that we expect uh, proper responses uh, to uh, any of the queries that we have raised, but absolutely that the recommendations, as outlined, are followed and the results produced. Perhaps I wasn't clear, Chair. My disappointment was that we didn't meet the expectations of the committee, rather than that you have asked us back. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for that clarification. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. That's lightened that a bit. Um, okay, so we'll go to questions then. And uh, okay, that's that session. Mark, Mark if we can, if, if you can direct uh, to either of your colleagues as appropriate as we go along. Um, so we'll leave that to yourself. Um, in terms of recommendation one, the recommendation is quite clear that the Department of Education and the Education Authority should do a review to assess the current funding mechanism, how funding is used by schools to target those most in need, and the impact of the funded uh, interventions. The response does not seem to suggest that such a review has taken place or is planned. Uh, so if you could explain why that's the case. Well, I think if, if we look through the recommendation, um, it, 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 it refers to a review and also refers to the need for school-led flexibility um, to allow for further autonomy in the use of, of, of SEND funds, and we can come to that. Um, in terms of, of a review, uh, 
the work that we have ongoing at the moment in our end-to-end -end review of uh, school improvement uh, is looking at the whole, the whole process of um, school improvement, right from the policy, uh, right through how things are, are uh, uh, supported through the education authority and other managing authorities, right through to what happens in schools. And that is something that Lindsay can give a bit more detail on, but really we're working with, with schools and with the managing authorities on to look at how can we ensure that schools, first of all, assess their strengths and weaknesses, how they can identify the action that they need to take and others need to take in order to address those uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses, uh, including, in particular, um, the barriers uh, that are faced by particular groups of pupils, including disadvantaged pupils, uh, and what can best uh, be done about that. And that um, end to end review will lead to a, a uh, complete review of our, of our um, Every School is a Good School policy, which, as you know, is the main school, school improvement policy. It will impact on the nature of the support provided by the EA and others. Uh, and giving advice to schools, uh, and it will also um, play into and uh, feed into how resources are delivered to schools and what flexibility schools are given in deciding how they should actually allocate the funds, use the funds, and then how they should account for what they have done with the funds. So that is the mechanism that we are using to take forward the review. So I would make the point that we are actually undertaking a review. That is the review, the end-to-end -end review. It covers both the specific element of TSN funding, but goes beyond that to cover um, the, uh, the, the, the wider issues around school improvement. It may be that the committee was more focused on the TSN funding element within the LMS formula, uh, and that that's the review that the committee would have a view that hasn't happened yet. And that was a review that was on the agenda previously. Um, it was shelled by one of the previous ministers because of pressures of work uh, during COVID. Uh, and it's one that remains on the agenda to be picked up again whenever with the current minister uh, as part of the uh, forward work programme. Do you want to say anything about the end, -end review, Lindsay? Yeah. Yes, certainly. So we've we've two end to end reviews underway: uh, one on school improvement and the other around special educational needs. Both of those are focused on. Ultimately, the priority being in providing high quality services that um, create positive outcomes for children and young people. But the second element is around the cost effectiveness of the approaches. And both of those, as Mark has said, is taking that end to end approach. And that's right through from reviewing the policy, both in terms of the, extent, the existing school improvement policy, every school a good school, and our special educational needs policy, and then how that policy is operationalised through the EA support and the support delivered through other arm's length bodies and delivery partners across the education system, and then how that translates practically within the school environment. So that will be looking at funding delivery models, in particular in the end-to-end -to -end review around special educational needs. And I know that is that is one issue that you've highlighted in particular, that flexibility for schools and schools having that ability to be flexible in the, the use of their resources to respond to special educational needs. That's a very strong theme through the end-to-end -end review of special educational needs in terms of how we strike that balance between providing a framework um, and that accountability framework within schools operate, but also give them that flexibility to be able to respond to the needs as they see them presenting in their classroom in an agile way, recognising that those needs can change from year to year. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I appreciate that, Lindsay, very much. You'll understand now why there's a bit of frustration about the responses, Mark, because what you have said is fairly different from the response we've said. It's not entirely clear in the response. Uh, in relation to that particular recommendation, and you provide a bit of an outline as, as how as to how the review has been or is taking place. So, just for for clarification, <coughs> you're, you're saying the review has taken place. So there's, there's, a, there's a review currently underway. On, on, underway, yeah. started. Yes, right, yes, okay. started, started over a year ago. Right, okay, that's grand, okay. Uh, but I think the confusion, as I said, is is that I think the focus of the committee on this one may have been around specifically the TSN funding yeah. and the common funding formula, and a review of the whole common funding has not been initiated. It was shelled by the previous minister, as I said, and it's something that we're looking at in, in, in the future, and it will come back onto the work programme when we're able to take that forward, and the minister decides to do that. 
But the work that we refer to the end to end review is broader than that. It goes, it looks at all school improvement. So it wouldn't just be disadvantaged children, it's broader than that. But within that, obviously, the impact on those who are disadvantaged is critical. And yeah. how funding is used is critical. And it would also include how the money that's received through the common funding formula is used. That's all, all part of that. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a separate but linked review to what would happen ultimately under LMS. And again, LMS, whenever it is reviewed, would go beyond just the disadvantaged element. It would be through everything. So really, there, there, two, there, would, there would be two overlapping reviews, is, is the point I'm making. But the NDM review has been progressing. Good progress has been made. Very good engagement with school leaders and, and other academic experts uh, on this. And um, that's, that's the, 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 uh, the main mechanism in which we're trying to help schools to uh, self-assess and uh, to drive up standards. Okay, and you, you just you made reference to a previous minister. When did did uh, when when did the minister decide to shove that? I like it was Peter Weir. It um, was uh, I think it was in twenty twenty one, but it was really following the response of the to the COVID pandemic pandemic, where staff had to be redeployed to other priority areas of work, uh, chair, and the program was suspended. I suppose on the outset of the pandemic in March twenty twenty, and then was formally uh, closed. Uh, a year later in 2021 with still pressure on resources and recovering of the education system. And it remains paused at this stage. Okay, we're now in our third uh, education minister since then. So, Is this something that's been raised with the current minister? It's, it's something that, that we have discussed in broad terms with the, with the uh, current minister uh, and we're working through uh, a future work programme uh, to, 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 to bring to him for uh, the next period, period of time and that will be one that we will be cons considering but I have to say there are a lot of pressures on the department at the moment and the minister will need to prioritise very very carefully uh, uh, on, on uh, what, what can be taken forward and the uh, review of the whole common funding fund is a huge undertaking. That decision was reached in 2021 but the, uh, this, this particular report, these recommendations were set out in around February 2022, isn't that right? Yeah, so. Sorry, Chair. She just say it was, it was paused in 2021, but any kind of reconsideration of reopening again was paused again, pending the independent review of education, which obviously was going to have an impact on the wider educational structure. So that there was a rationale in terms of let's keep it, let's wait for the outworkings of the independent review before any kind of further work on the common funding formula was uh, reconsidered as well. Okay, thank you. Um, You've indicated that there are a number of other funding sources available to schools to address the attainment gap. How does the department currently assess the impact of these schemes? Well, there, there, there are a number of other uh, funding sources, as well as the, the, the TSN funding that goes to uh, schools. There's the Extended Schools Programme, for example. Um, there's some just over nine million uh, uh, is, made, is made available to schools for for. Uh, additional activities both before and after school um, and additional support to those pupils that need, 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 need it. Um, and there's the full service programmes in North and West Belfast. There's also the education wraparound programme uh, and other areas of um, significant dep deprivation. Um, in terms of, of the, the uh, evaluation uh, of those, I mean, th those would, would, would be part of the, the, uh, the, the broader accountability arrangements. Um, and again, there are issues with our ability to take forward the accountability arrangements as a consequence of action sort of strike over so many years, um, uh, both, both in, the, in, in, in the period running up to COVID, then we had COVID, then we had, I think, about four or five months where there wasn't action sort of strike, and then we were straight back into action sort of strike. Hopefully, uh, not hopefully, we are now back out of action sort of strike, and that will... Um, will uh, enable us to work with schools to get the information that previously uh, was not being made available, um, to get that information to enable us to have a, a, a better indication of the impact of both these programmes and any other issues that are there, and of course, to uh, allow for the uh, recommencement of inspection, which has been a major uh, miss over that long period of time. So, am I right in saying then that you're saying it's difficult to evaluate the effectiveness of the schemes because of strike action? That, that, is, that has been a key element in terms of the fact that the strike action 
part of that was was uh, not making data available uh, on either at pupil level data or at a school level. So the information has not been coming back to the department, um, and the fact there's been no. Uh, uh, Inspection. It doesn't mean we don't know anything about what's going on in schools. I would want to reassure you around that. I mean, we have district inspectors still have contact with schools, and, and we would we would talk regularly with the inspectorate. Um, we um, would also have have contact with in, individual pr uh, uh, principals and principals groups, uh, and get feed, feed, feedback there. And we we know from the input from from them that they find, for example, the um, the funding for extended schools to be particularly valuable with the flexibility that gives them. Um, and we know too that the uh, the education wraparound program is one that has been wel welcomed and we've been out and we've visited those particular projects. Is there anything you would like to add to that? No? I think you'd, you'd mentioned other locality-based programs, Mark, for example, in Greater Shankill, yes. um, West Belfast. Um, we would have very close and ongoing engagement with those programs. Um, there is actually fairly active evaluation material made available to the department from those lead partner organisations. We'd be very happy to follow up with further detail around the impact of those schemes. But separately, as Mark has said, I've certainly recently visited almost all of the schools involved in that West Belfast programme, for example, and seen at first hand the impact of the funding, the added value that that funding is bringing to what are, let's be honest, extremely disadvantaged communities facing very complex challenges. Challenges um, and the, the emerging data from those locality based programmes is certainly something that's very positive in terms of the impact on children and young people. And it's what we'll be using to feed into future locality based programmes in terms of tackling disadvantage, getting closer to the issues, working more closely with schools, and developing those partnerships at a neighbourhood basis. Okay, thank you. I'm just thinking again, Mark, before I move on to the Deputy Chairperson, Cheryl Brown. Whenever Minister Weir paused uh, or shelved, whatever is the most accurate, uh, that previous arrangement, was it not the case that it was done because in 2021 he had to redeploy quite a number of staff to work on COVID planning? Was that the case back then? There were a whole range of work streams that had been identified as part of the, uh, the previous uh, work, work agreement. And then when COVID came in, yes, staff had to be redeployed uh, to, to other uh, areas. Uh, and as Peter explained, then after that, uh, there were the reasons why it, wasn't, it hadn't been taken up because they, they, they reported the Independent Review of Education. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no question over as to why it would have happened at that time frame. Obviously, it was very challenging for, uh, for all schools. and. I have no doubt their schools probably would have welcomed it to enable them to focus on COVID issues. But it's now 2024, and I would be hoping that that is reflected to the Minister, that we should really be moving in the right direction in relation to this. And, you know, those staff should... Have any of those staff been put back in place? No, no, and I should say that that review of the Common Funding Scheme, it was a project under the wider Transformation Programme, which commenced in 2018. Um, it was uh, there was only a few members of staff. It was a you know it was a challenging project, but there was only a few members of staff involved, and obviously they're they're duly deployed as other tasks currently as well. You know, so it's not that there's existing resources to be put back in immediately, but obviously it'll be something we can raise with the minister, as you said. I think I think to the other factor to bear in mind is is that in that intervening period as well, there was no executive for quite a period of time, there was no minister for quite a period of time. And something as significant as the common funding formula uh, would have required that political oversight and that political direction, both in order to launch such a major consultation and then to take any action on it. So it's really something that properly needs to have a minister uh, in, in place. And that's something, as I say, we will bring that to the minister we were discussing with him, uh, uh, both what you've said today in terms of the committee, uh, in terms of the, the importance that you attach to this, uh, and we'll also be giving him, him our own advice on that because we know there are issues in the common fund that need to be addressed and not solely in this area there are other issues that we need to address but it is a major undertaking and we need to be staffed up to be able to deliver on that and frankly at the minute we are creaking at the seams uh, both in terms of pressures that are on us the vacancies we have the budget pressures that we have and the gaps that we have in our in our staffing and our inability even when we have funds in some areas to recruit people because there aren't people available so we ha we're having to prioritise very, very sharply uh, on, on all of these matters, which, and I'm sure every department is telling you the same thing. Yeah, the, the only thing in relation to that, now, I, I can't disagree with, with, with much of what you've said, to be honest, Mark, but the only thing that, that I would point to is 
If, if the staff haven't been put back in, does that reflect that this isn't really a priority for the department? It reflects that, that the fact that I just mentioned that it would, re would have required uh, political oversight at the time to take forward, so that was an important factor. Um, but uh, and now it reflects the fact that we have a, a, a very challenging agenda, much of it around finance, uh, and that this is something that we will put before the Minister and he will want to decide what priority he wants to attach to it in terms of how it sits with all the other things that need to be done. And of course, as you've rightly pointed out, the absence of government, an executive or a minister, I have no doubt hinders the function of life in the department. But given the instability and certainty of this place, I'm sure the civil service is very resilient now to ensuring that the ship can sail on in the absence of a captain in the department mm. being the minister. So it's, uh, I do take on board your points. It's unjustifiable that there's never a minister in place uh, at various periods of time in, 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 uh, in government here. But unfortunately, it has happened and there's been dire consequences of it, which are very well rehearsed by me and others. And I appreciate your reflection on that as well. So thank you. And I think, Chair, if I could add, dur during that time, as Mark, as we've already said in our, our opening comments, um, we've been taking forward or initiated those other reviews in terms of the end-to-end -end reviews. We've also done some important work in terms of re reviewing the newcomer policy, yeah. for example, which did flag up particular issues around the, the funding and support of newcomers. And all of that information emerging from those various reviews will then inform our advice to the min minister on any potential next steps, obviously taking on board the need, the need to prioritise. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Chair O'Brienley, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you so much um, so far. I suppose I just wanted to touch on the recommendation three um, when we discussed about data um, and how important data is for making better decisions. So, my question would be um, in terms of key stage assessments, um, they have not taken place for four years, um, and the review, which you say remains a strategic pri priority to replace them, has yet to start. So. Do you think that this has been acceptable, um, and how long does the Department of Ed envisage that this review will um, be to commence, and how long do you think that will take? Well, you've asked a couple of questions here, and I, I, I touched on some, some of them, and Lindsay will give you the detail. Um, is it acceptable? It's regrettable that we don't have assessment data, because we need assessment data <coughs> for a range of reasons, including to get clarity over uh, how this, our system as a whole is performing. At the moment, we have limited uh, information around that, although we do have some international studies that we participate in um, that, are, 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 that, that give us a sense of the issues that we're facing and, and um, which groups of pu pupils are performing well and which are performing less well, although even those have been impacted by action short of strike as well because schools refused to participate. And in some cases, we weren't able to actually uh, 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 identify sufficient schools to be able to take part in those uh, in international studies. I'm talking about the, the PISA study and the um, the TIM study and the Pearl study when I, when I say that. Um, so assessment is, is <coughs> important both for telling us about the, um, the overall system but also for uh, the information it provides to schools and school leaders about how well the schools are performing and the information it gives about pupils, which, which enables teachers to direct their learning and direct the support in the right way to help the children and young people. So it is, it is really, really important and something we're very keen to make sure is uh, reinstated. But at that point, I'll hand over to Lindsay to give a bit more detail around that. Yeah. Certainly, and, and as, as Mark has said, it is regrettable that, that we've been in that position. Uh, the department has prioritised this piece of work. A team has been stood up, recognising that it is not a sustainable position, that we don't have that system level key stage data at key stages one and two. So it's now taking forward that review of statutory assessment, um, which was also one of the nine workload uh, agreements. Um, and we'll continue to be engaging really closely uh, with the NITC and other stakeholders around that. Um, so the review will make a number of policy policy recommendations um, in terms of the, the future purpose, nature and design of what key stage assessment needs to look um, like and benchmarking that against um, best practice approaches across the UK, the Republic of Ireland 
um, internationally as well. Um, as Mark has said, the industrial action over the last number of years has significantly impacted on those arrangements. Um, but now that we have emerged from that, uh, those, that industrial action, we expect very positive engagement. And certainly, all of the signs to date have yeah. been that that engagement is going to be very positive yeah. moving forward. Um, in parallel, the Department has been working really closely with SIA um, and back in 2017-18 had commissioned SIA to undertake, as I'm sure you'll be aware, a computer adaptive testing pilot in 2017-18. In um, 240 schools are now participating in that pilot. Uh, in recognition of the importance of that pilot having a degree of continuity and building confidence around it, uh, the Minister took the decision that that pilot can continue until March 2027, within which time we will be taking forward the review of statutory assessment, which will develop some policy options. But within that, we will be looking at options at how that pilot can be scaled up to include more schools and, indeed, if we can go beyond just literacy and numeracy to look at example about, about children's wellbeing, etc., and their view of school. Um, so there is a plan in place around those next steps, um, but it is important that we do learn the lessons of the past in terms of being very clear about the purpose of the data and how we are working and engaging with schools yeah. around that. Um, I appreciate that. I suppose, but um, in this kind of time frame that we're operating in, with the absence of that kind of data, um, how is the department um, being able to ensure that effective guidance and policies have been developed, um, and that resources have been allocated to pupils that need them in areas that are in need? And obviously, it's important to say, although we don't have that system level data, we know that schools at a school level are each commissioning um, this this type. That this type of work and largely are working with providers like GL Assessment, for example, to have that assessment at a school level. So that would be something ETI would be looking at, as, as um, Mark has said, although there has not been formal inspection due to action short of strike, the visits of those district inspectors has been hugely important in terms of going into schools. And that would be the, the type of issue that they would be looking at, at how data is being used to drive performance at, at a school level. Um, and that is something that, that certainly out in school visits we pick up regularly around how schools are doing that and how they are amending and enhancing their practice in line with what that, that data is showing up. I appreciate that. I just wanted, um, it was just brought to my attention recently, um, there is the prevalence of autism in school aged children in Northern Ireland. There is a report obviously collated by the schools through the census data, and then I believe it's. it's uh, Created by the department. Um, now that has been ongoing since 2011, but it seems that the information um, hasn't been provided for this year's report, the 2023-24 report. Um, it was just in recent co correspondence that's been received. So it's just to say, um, you know, is the department aware of this, um, and how can we move forward to ensure that that data is made available? As, as far as I'm aware, the schools have responded. But the level of um, pupil level information in terms of special needs or medical needs wasn't included within that, so we're not then aware of that type of data, um, which of course is is, is huge um, at the moment. So it's something that I would like yeah, to see. And again, through. that that has been one of the the outworkings of um, the action short of strike and the census returns. Um, that were provided from some, so some schools didn't return the information. Some returned them in part, and, and undoubtedly, that has led to issues and gaps in terms of our information. But as I say, now that we have emerged from from that period, we're very hopeful and entering a more positive stage. Uh, and data is one of those areas where where we really need to urgently address. Thank you. Uh, John Stewart, Emily. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks very much for coming today and for your answers so far. My um, two or three questions relate to recommendation four. So the response indicates that existing key stage targets set prior to the pandemic are no longer relevant or appropriate, and that you, the Department, will develop new arrangements for statutory assessments, including appropriate targets. I'm just wondering, firstly, when these new arrangements and targets are likely to be in place? That will be a key part of the work that we're taking forward through the review of statutory assessment. I think there's an acceptance both across schools with SIA and the department that it isn't practically 
uh, deliverable to just revert to, to what had happened prior to this period. And so part of the review of statutory assessment will be looking at how we establish that baseline data, um, the purpose of that data, and then what appropriate targets um, need to look like running alongside that. Another important consideration in all of this, going back to, to what we mentioned earlier in terms of our end-to-end -end review of school improvement, is the review of our school improvement policy, every school a good school, and within that, um, the need to review our count, read, succeed um, strategy in terms of literacy and numeracy, um, and accepted that the first point in that is establishing our baseline, and so that's why we are prioritising the review of statutory assessment, and that will take forward looking at what that baseline needs to be and how we move forward. It's all dependent on that, then, so the stage is no real time frame the, the to that aspect of it. At this stage, but we would hope to be to be putting proposals to the minister <coughs> around options and that over the next number of months. Okay, no problem. Um, just moving on, then I think we. Um, let me see. The final paragraph, I think, of the uh, of the response, I think we all find quite worrying, um, and it can be read that no matter what action the department takes or what money it puts into it, it cannot guarantee that it will achieve the targets. Do you think this is an acceptable response, and should we be worried about that? Well, I think what what the broader point that is being made in the um, response. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the very heart of, of what this uh, report is all about. Yeah. Um, it talks about, um, I've seen a reference to narrowing the gap, I've seen a reference to closing the gap. Mm. The reality is that in every educational system across the world, there is a relationship between social deprivation and levels of educational achievement. Uh, and there, is, there are differences in levels of attainment as a consequence. There's no country that I am aware of that has, that has completely closed the gap and led to absolutely no differences uh, between uh, those from different uh, socio-economic groups. But what we can do and what we want to do and what we're determined to do is to try and make sure that we're providing as much support as we can, removing what barriers we can, to make sure that that gap is as small as it possibly can be. Now, we do know that in very specific circumstances, uh, we have schools which buck the trend uh, and which, despite being in areas of high deprivation, uh, are able to produce really quite stunning results. Uh, and uh, I've been many years in the, in the department, and, <coughs> and uh, there are always examples like this of, of, of schools uh, which are capable of doing this, often with, with, with very dynamic and inspirational and charismatic principles supported by really good boards of governors. But they also need the community around them. And Lindsay can say a little bit about the work that we're doing uh, around that. And we have worked hard to try and disseminate that practice, to share that practice. The reality is it's not just as easily transplanted as, as, as we might wish. So I think that last comment wasn't meant to be, in any sense, uh, a, a, um, a, a, an expression of either despair or of lack of effort. Yeah. It was just a reality that um, we will do what we can. We believe there's important progress that can be made with the right resources, with the right support, and I mentioned the word resources, and, and I haven't actually said anything about budget much today. Budget. And budget, budget is dire, mm -hmm. and budget is going to have a huge impact on all the work that we're talking about here t today. And I, I can't leave here today without registering with this committee that the existing programmes are under huge threat uh, because of the, the budget. Um, and uh, the notion that we will be in a position to um, enhance those Budgets extend or enhance those programs, extend those programs or develop new ones is somewhat fanciful at this point. Uh, we, we are in a very, very serious situation in terms of education funding generally, and that is going to have an impact on our capacity to, to, to support um, uh, a lot of these programs, which is all the more reason why we fall back on the, the professionalism and the quality of our teaching force. Uh, and I know that it's quite right that the committee asks us. How do we ensure that schools are doing the right thing? And of course, we need accountability mechanism for that. But we also need to recognise that we have professionals in schools, committed professionals, supported by boards of governors, who are committed to the best interests of children, uh, and will be seeking at all times to ensure that children are advancing and are developing, are being appropriately assessed, and that those uh, who are not benefiting as much as they should um, are receiving the support that they actually require. So we take great confidence from that, but we check, <laughs> as this committee would expect, that that. that we do.
Thanks for that response. Just one follow up to that, if you don't mind, Dr. Brown. Um, you talked about those schools rightly who are trailblazing in this and, 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 and are setting the standard and bucking the trend. And I'm just wondering what we could do to sort of take what they're doing and replicate that. You did refer to it and what more we could do. And also, what were, is working well around the world in terms of models of best practice who maybe aren't funding it as well but have different approaches to this and maybe looking at things differently? Absolutely. And again, I'll take you back to the end um, review of, of school improvement and special educational needs because core tenets of those are co-design and engagement with the system, mm. but also um, that close engagement with practitioners. So learning from where there's really good practice across the system now, I know that that's also something the ETI has built into their new approach to inspection and within their own resources that they're carving out the time and resource to be able to share and, pr and platform that good practice across the system. But it's also something that we're building into um, the operationalisation piece of the end end review of school improvement. So it's not just about looking about the policy, but it's looking at how is that then effectively delivered across the system and how are schools supported and not just supported when they reach a challenging time or when they reach crisis point. Actually, how are all schools supported to be better? And that sharing of practice across the system is one thing that we're building into that. Also drawing in um, academics through our academic and practitioner advisory group to be able to share with us learning internationally what has been working well as well. So mm -hmm. it is opening our thinking to other ways of working. So those are our key design principles in that end-to-end -end review. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Uh, John, John just hits on a point that I was going to raise. Uh, so ginger minds alike and all that. Um, <laughs> you know, they got a better education. <laughs> <laughs> Have we any have we any markers as to how well we're doing compared to um, um, internationally compared to other countries? Do do we know where we sit in relation to any? Is there any areas of good practice? Yeah, well, the um, the evidence that we've got from uh, from PISA and from TIMS and from from Pearl suggests that actually our performance is is good. Uh, and, 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 and internationally, um, particularly in terms of reading, um, and uh, that the um, the effect of social deprivation uh, here uh, is uh, no more no more marked than is the average across the OECD. Uh, so there's no evidence here that there's a bigger problem um, uh, as 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 referenced uh, through PISA. Uh, than anywhere else. Um, so that is some comfort in the sense that we know we have high levels of disadvantage here. Uh, so the fact that we don't have a bigger gap uh, indicates that, that, that uh, the policies are, are having an impact. Uh, and there's also been some work done on the basis of, of those high performing systems. Um, yeah. um, and in terms of those international studies that, that Mark has, has talked about, um, it's countries like Singapore and Finland are, are consistently uh, at the top. Um, and some research that was done in terms of looking at the features of those systems, we're certainly drawing on that in terms yeah. of informing our thinking around our policy development. So they, they look at who becomes teachers. So they focus on the quality of their teachers. They invest in their teachers. They invest in their development. And then they put the, the systems and the supports around those teachers, wrapping around them to make the most impact on children and young people. And that's very much the central th thread of both end end reviews that we're talking about. How do we empower our teachers and support them because we know mm -hmm. that they are the people that make the most difference to our children's outcomes. Either Again, that was resource dependent. Industrial action would have been a key step in ensuring any of that before you go anywhere. So yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean that's that's a key demonstration of the value that is that is placed in teachers. Um, I mean they, all the research shows that no system can outperform the quality of its teaching workforce. Uh, and we know that it's good quality teaching and learning. That is at the core of everything. Uh, that's 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 what makes a difference in terms of education. <coughs> Can't disagree, given my former principals at the back of the room. <laughs> but uh, I, I, there's a, in terms of the model of best practice, uh, how would that be disseminated against uh, to all schools in Northern Ireland? I think 
that's probably a, a variety of reasons. Chair, I think ETI would say they would have a core role in that in terms of sharing uh, best practice system wide, and they've certainly pivoted their model to that idea of empowerment of the system as yeah. well, and that sharing of best practice is one element of that. I certainly think the department has a role to play in that in terms of its dissemination and sharing the learning, and I think that is something um, as we take forward the end-to-end -end reviews, we're certainly um, including a lot of engagement with practitioners, workshop with, in, with practitioners, learning from what's happening and happening really well at the system mm -hmm. already and how that can be shared and replicated. But as Mark said, sometimes it's not so easy to lift something from one locality to another. So it's how we're taking the learning from that uh, and building it and translating it. Um, and that will be a key tenant of the, the recently announced RAISE programme uh, mm -hmm. that will be tackling disadvantage in a number of localities. Um, and a, a core feature of that will be sharing learning and best practice. So I, I think, think there's a range of Another aspect which we refer to is really the area learning communities. Um, I mean, we, we expect that schools will cooperate and collaborate with each other to share best practice. Uh, and work in clusters, and the area learning communities provide a mechanism for them. That's a key, 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 key part of their purpose, and we know that they um, can, can be really effective uh, where schools engage and share best practice and share problems and, and, and so forth uh, as well. So that's another key, key, key way of disseminating. I would also make the point that our policy documents all include examples of best practice also. Now they are being updated, but the, the current ones, they may be dated, but they, the basic principles and the basic uh, uh, approaches in them are all sound and remain valid. And that's a key way also uh, of, of disseminating best practice. And we certainly use every opportunity that, that comes along. Um, we're actually of members of the British Council, uh, Four Nations policy meetings where the education departments come together. And so there's that sharing um, on both an east west and a north south uh, basis in terms of, of practice that's happening elsewhere as well. I yeah, appreciate that. Uh, just very, very briefly, you'd made reference to the ETA, but even in the absence of an, an industrial action, they only visit a small sample of schools. So is that the best approach? I think in terms of formal inspection, yes, obviously there's a, a, a programme of inspection. There's only ever a limited number of schools. Um, but Mark referred earlier to those district uh, inspection visits, which I think are, are really key. And that's where the really close relationships are, are built up with the schools. And certainly the feedback we would receive from schools is that they find those relationships immensely helpful. Mm -hmm. And the district inspector being a really important part of their school improvement mechanism and supporting them, giving advice and, and challenge yeah. where, where that's required. So I think, yes, th those formal inspections w will only ever be possible to happen every so often, but it's those those regular monitoring visits and those district inspection mm. visits that are so important. And obviously, you have the EA School Improvement uh, School Development Service and their school improvement professionals that are engaging with schools in the system on an ongoing basis as well. I think the EA also, Chair, have, have it's not the EA, the ETI, yeah. have also um, recently uh, been publishing a number of thematic reports which pull together some of the findings from or, you know, schools or, or, or around a particular aspect yeah. of the curriculum, and they are pu published. That's another way of getting and disseminating uh, best practice. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go to Derry now to Padraig Delargy, MLA. Padraig, you can hear us and see us okay? You're... Yeah. Okay. So, firstly, thank you for your answer so far. Um, I was particularly interested just in your, your comments about um, Finland there um, and, and just around those other models of best practice. I suppose I, I'm a former primary school teacher um, myself, so I, I understand a lot of this and, 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 and I suppose around the attainment gaps and, and, and that across the schools. The one big thing that I noticed, um, and, and I suppose in, in our pedagogy looking across the, the, the schools and across different international models, was around all, all the models that you've mentioned have put a real emphasis on, on early years. Um, so I suppose even I'm going to be asking around recommendation five, but I just wanted to touch a wee bit on that point. Um, is that something that has been looked at in this? Because th those models which you've looked at obviously place huge amount um, of, of emphasis on play-based learning um, and on, on that early years model, you know, like even starting school later and stuff. Um, and, and that is huge in itself in actually 
um, you know, removing some of the barriers to education by having that, that play-based learning for all children. Yeah, well, I mean, th th this has been a, 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 an ongoing discussion for quite a lot of years, Patrick, um, and uh, I, I think so there is the fact that our children start, tend to start formal education uh, at, at, a, at an earlier age. But when we say formal education, it's still formal education, which is based around, has a, has a play-based approach uh, in, the, in, the, in the early year or two. So it's not quite as stark a difference as sometimes it can appear to be. Uh, and quite often when you look at other uh, uh, countries, while they don't start formally, the children are actually engaged in very many of the same sorts of activities that children in our schools would be engaged in. So I think the, the, the difference is probably more apparent than real. But yes, we do look at other models and we do look at and early intervention is absolutely critical for us and we're, spending, we're focusing a lot on that, but I suspect you want to come back on that, so I'll not say any more at this point. No, absolutely. And, and look, I totally agree. I thought primary one to myself for a year, so um, well, well aware of, of that. I think that the, the change in the curriculum has been really positive and has actually helped um, the, the kind of a small, smooth out some of those um, gaps which, which were there previous to that. Once children get beyond P3 and 4, the play stops very much and, and, and I suppose very suddenly, um, the play-based learning. So it's, it's just continuing that um, and even just the, the active learning throughout, I think, is, is essential to that. But separate conversation um, for, for another day, you can nearly do a, a report on that on itself um, and the opportunities that that offers. So, look, my questions really relate to recommendation five. Um, You've talked in that about setting appropriate targets um, and accepting that that is really, I suppose, key to raising standards, to reducing the attainment gap. Um, but my reading of that is that there is no currently um, no measurable or time-bound targets in place. So is that something that the department are going to look at? Um, and I suppose what's the rationale behind not currently having those time-bound targets in place? I suppose a couple of things I would I would say, Padre. Yes, we will be moving to a point in the future when we've worked through on the assessment, as Lindsay was talking about, uh, and uh, as part of the the end end and review of school improvement, looking at targets and what appropriate targets should 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 be that are both. Um, we always have this argument about targets uh, that are both uh, stretching, uh, but also attainable, in order that they provide the right. Um, sort of uh, uh, focus and, and, and incentive for the system as a whole. But the reality of all of this is, is that it, you know, it, there's not a monolithic system out there. It, it relies on the actions of all the individual schools and it relies on the actions of individual teachers within the classroom with individual pu pupils. So the key to really affecting systemic change around this is the work that we do in skilling up our teachers. Uh, and supporting their, their professional development and making sure that they're properly resourced in the classroom, in disseminating best practice, all the things we've talked about uh, to date, to ensure that they can give the right sort of tailored support in the right way to, to children and young pe pe people to help them to make the progress that they need to make. And the reality is we can set targets till the cows come home, but unless we have effective policies uh, in support of that, unless we have the right funding, unless we have motivated te te teachers, unless we have pr pr principals who are setting out very clear school development plans, uh, identifying where progress needs to be made and the actions necessary to take that, and unless we have boards of governors who are overseeing that and, and inputting to that and making sure that is being delivered, then it doesn't matter what targets the department sets, frankly, because nothing will happen. So we rely on the entire system. Uh, so we are going to move to setting targets. We have to uh, assess what is realistic around that and do it in line with the end to end, end review. But the real change here will be made by the other policies and, and, and the wider approach that we will take that will affect our, both our teaching system and, and how we can draw in other departments uh, and how we can draw in the communities, as Lindsay mentioned, through the RAISE programme and similar type programmes, how we can draw all of them in to help uh, to support education. Okay, um, I, I just have one more question, but I think I might have missed on that um, around the time bound targets. So that was just a specific question. I, could be my oversight here and missed that. Well, but as, as, what is as, the... as part of this, we will certainly be considering time bound targets uh, and, and, and what is feasible around this, but that will come out of the work around assessment and come out of the work around the development of, of the school improvement uh, uh, policy and programme. The other point I would make, of course, is that. 
Um, we have time-bound budgets, one year at a time. That doesn't help time-bound targets very much. If you're asking me to set a target for three years down the track, four years down the track, well, I want to know what is my budget going to be? How much will I have available to support the policies that are going to be there? I'm being given budgets after the start of the, the year uh, for one year. Uh, so how can I possibly set out targets and be held to targets when I'm not clear what the, uh, what the funding is going, is going to, to, to be? So we'll have to, have to be mindful of that. There's an interaction between resource and between what are reasonable and meaningful targets to be set. At, I'm not suggesting we can't set targets. I'm just saying that there are important factors right with our control which will impact on our ability to deliver on them. Yeah, well, I would totally agree with you, and especially on the you know the three-year budget is obviously something which was agreed prior to um, the assembly collapsing or being collapsed in, in 2022. Um, so you know definitely it's something that, that is necessary there, um, <laughs> and even the reliance on a year funding as well just makes your job a lot more difficult. Um, so so totally appreciate the points you've made. And, I mean, without getting into party politics, it's obviously something we've we've been pushing. I think other parties are on the same page. So definitely, you know, something which we as a committee and need to take back to our parties and, and, and very much push as well. Um, just last question on that is um you've you've described your current measure of the attainment gap as narrow. Um so I mean why has this continued to be used for so long then? Has there been a, a an assessment of that in the past. Obviously, it's something in the future we hope could be assessed, but um, just keen to hear a wee bit more about that. Sorry, Potter, I wasn't sure. I didn't quite understand that the question. Could you just repeat that? Yeah. So I'll, I'll just read out the question I've actually written. Um, just for that, so uh, you describe your current measure of the attainment gap as narrow. Why have you been using it for so long then, and would you continue to use it? Yeah, well, I think um, that is, is referring to the nature of reducing education down to a single figure, mm. uh, a single figure based perhaps uh, on, in some cases, a single test or a few tests, and I'm suggesting that it's the sum total of a child's education, and that would never be our position. Now, when you're trying to look at things like targets and everybody wants simplicity and everybody wants a single figure to sum everything up, you get driven sometimes to, to that uh, um, uh, outcome. But that is not where we want to be. We, we believe in, in, in the breadth of education. We believe in the, uh, uh, the other aspects that children have in terms of creativity, in terms of, of um, their relationships with their peers, in terms of how they contribute to society, uh, as well as the knowledge and understanding they have around the, uh, the curriculum, uh, the, 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 their vocational ability, their ability in sport and so forth. Mm -hmm. And yet many of the measures we use are narrow. They are simply around how many GCSEs or how did you do in a particular uh, uh, assessment. So th I think that's what we mean by that, and we're trying to develop a broader suite. Do you want to say something more about that? Absolutely, and, and, and that point is something that has emerged very explicitly through the review of the school improvement policy. So at the minute, and we know all the reasons why the, the measure we use is GCSE star to C, and it's not to say that that's not an important one, of course, um, that educational attainment one is, but it's about looking at what a broader suite um, of measures and associated targets w would look like and what they would look like for all of our children. Um, and that's an important piece we're looking at at the minute in terms of the work around special educational needs, um, recognising um, that, of course, we need to be able to chart our progress and the difference we're making in those children's lives. That's vital. But that needs to be through an appropriate measure. Um, and so those are the sorts of conversations we are looking at. And as Mark has said, it is about that broader suite that recognises there are many elements that need to come together to really support a child to learn and to learn effectively and to succeed. And for our children, that success might look different. So that is something that, that we need to look at. And it is impacted, as Mark has said, by, by a whole range of factors. Yeah, no, certainly agree, and, and I suppose it's it's very hard situation to be in because you're trying to balance the the holistic development of a child, but also you know ha not having those measures and, and I suppose time bound measures in place for say English and maths, then it, there is a risk of going the other way as well. So it's it's a fine balancing act. But um, thank you very much for all the detail. I really appreciate that.
Uh, just following on from what Patrick has outlined there, I, I think, uh, and I may be wrong, but I think I'm certainly right, this has been talked about since 2008, so why are we still looking at it? <coughs> the, the, the how we assessed, I think it's probably been talking for longer than that, uh, to be yeah, fair. Well, for uh, my knowledge, 2008. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there, there's, there's always a debate yeah. about, about what is the purpose of education, uh, yeah. what is the value of education, and how do you uh, assess performance. And then there's a, a wider debate about what is it the parents want from education, mm. and people translate that in different ways. I mean, our experience of what parents want from education is for, is for the child to be safe, mm. the child to be secure, and the child oh. to be happy. Those are the key things. And beyond that, they then want their children to progress and to yes. learn and uh, to be able to act as a curriculum and to have a future in which they can engage with others uh, in, a, in, in a, a positive way uh, in, in, in society and have the opportunity uh, for progress in, in, in their, in their, in their uh, career and in a job. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to encapsulate all of those kinds of aspects. But when when parents are choosing a school, uh, it's very few of them would just look at the exam results. If, I mean, any parent uh, who, who, who um, is thinking ser ser seriously about, about where they want to place their child will go to the school, will talk to the principal, talk to the teachers, get a sense of the atmosphere and the ethos in the school, look at things like pastoral care, will look at the range of, of, of supports that are available for ch children, will look at things like bullying and all the rest of it before they make a decision on where they will place their ch children. So. Um, those things we know are, are important, but they are very difficult. And how do you measure? Uh, I mean, we, we are looking at some things like, uh, like uh, um, self-efficacy, for example. There are, there are various instruments you can have around this. You know, the extent to which you feel you're in control of your own destiny and you make decisions that, that will affect your life or whether things are just done to you. There are instruments we can use like that, but they can be quite complex. So it does tend to get reduced down to exam results, but we all know. Uh, and parents know that education is about much more than, more than that. You're asking a question that politicians have been trying to solve for generations. How do you keep all the people happy all the time? <laughs> and uh, Mark, you've been extremely honest and direct in your answers, as, as always, uh, uh, and uh, that is very appreciated, by the way. You'd mentioned the issues in relation to achieving targets because of the challenges with funding, particularly multi-year budgets, and we're very well rehearsed on the absolute importance of it. I've been in this house for 10 years and we were talking about it as long as that and long before that, I have no doubt. At the minute, we're trying to get multi-year government, never mind multi-year budgets. But I do uh, absolutely understand uh, the frustration, particularly for someone in your position at the head of a department uh, in relation to that when it comes to planning and to achieving targets. So uh, rest assured, we understand how frustrating, I have no doubt, that is. Uh, Cahill Boylan, MLA. Thanks very much, Chair. I, did some, I felt as if I was sitting at an education committee meeting, so <laughs> I want to try and bring it back, Chair, to be honest, because it's an audit office report on part of the inquiry, and I appreciate all you've said, Mark, and the budgets and everything else, and I don't want to get into that debate today. So every day is a school day for all of us. So I want to take you down to recommendation six, and says here in terms of the Department's response indicate that they provide a range of evidence which demonstrates achievement of educational outcomes and value for money. But the Audit Office acknowledged these in the report, but commented that as with the services provided, monitoring of the impact varies from one sure start project to another. Given this and the fact that LEO is the LEO we call the Longitudinal Education Outcomes Database is still being developed, it is not clear how this recommendation has been developed. Would you like to respond, please? Well, I have to say that Sure Start is <clears throat> one of the programmes where I would say we have the clearest information about effectiveness, uh, both at individual project level and at wider system level. Um, there are a range of instruments which are used, both from the, um, the health side of things and the educational side of things, um, which are applied. Uh, by the, uh, the, the professionals who work in Sure Start uh, with the children in their care to assess where the children are when they, when they uh, first, first come into contact with Sure Start and how they progress uh, over time. Uh, I haven't got the detail in front of me, I think things like the welcome approach and the, the star approach uh, that, that, that they have, all of which is, is uh, uh, robust mechanisms. And I went through this at, at, the, at the last committee meeting uh, to set out the improvement that there had actually been there. 
Um, and that information is available uh, in, in the, the, the shear starts and is looked at. Um, at a, a wider uh, uh, system, I think the issue, or I say, uh, one issue is the extent to which while uh, individual uh, projects may perform well and perform well, uh, have good outcomes for ch ch children, how do we know whether that is sustained over time? And that's a slightly different question. Um, and that's where the LEO approach comes in, the longitudinal uh, um, study. And that, because it's longitudinal, they'll have to wait for the children to work their way through the system uh, to get the information there to know the extent to which um, these gains are maintained over time. But we can look to research that was done by the Institute of Fiscal Studies in 2021 and 2019, which set out the health benefits um, of uh, uh, Sure Start uh, and uh, at a system level in England. Uh, now, the same sort of approach is taken here, uh, and we can rely on that as evidence of the fact that the whole approach of Sure Start uh, works and is effective. And you said, I mean, clearly they're talking here about data and gathering data. And my reading of it, it, it should be consistent across the board. I know there's there were certain elements in every Sure Start programme that might be slightly different, but I, I think getting back to the level of consistency and sharing that data and, and learning from each practice should be is the key element going forward. My second one then is the recommendation seven, and I know there's an un undergoing review. Um, Every School a Good School was published in 2009, and Count Read Succeed was published in 2011. It seems you're just listing things that have been in place for years. What exactly has been done in response to the recommendation to improve the identification and sharing of best practice? I, I think the specific thing I would point to here is the end-to-end -end review of school improvement, which is looking, the first element of that is around reviewing every school a good school, and in taking forward that review, we've already had extensive engagement across the system with school leaders, uh, with education stakeholders in terms of, well, is, is that policy still very much... Um, fit for purpose in terms of its vision, in terms of the context we, we find ourselves in. Certainly the emerging feedback from that is that the characteristics set out within that policy are still very much relevant today, um, but there is work required to update the language of the policy um, and to bring the focus very firmly on the child. So yes, obviously the school is a really important mechanism within that, but there are also key influencers within the child's life in terms of the partnerships between the school and the wider community. So, so that work is ongoing. Peter, you can maybe say a little bit about the timeline around that in terms of, of that? Yeah, review. well, certainly the work's been ongoing to sort of map out the evidence in the last <coughs> uh, few months to try and identify, firstly, how we support schools, what kind of resources deployed, and then to try and develop options for what a, maybe an optimum model of service delivery might look like to take on point to take on board some of your comments about how do we share best practice how do we support teacher professional learning how do we uh, grab what good what's good in one school and ensure that it's, it's reflected in other places but also i suppose the point of the response and the recommendation was that those policies have been placed and there are things that have been underway since then to disseminate good practice and mark's mentioned some of them in terms of inspection reports that look at uh, highly effective practice which are obviously published and available the thematic reports the school improvement service um, area learning communities and also the ea supporting learning website which provides uh, good uh, period good points of examples of best practice but in terms of the end to end review we do want to get in a position probably um uh, certainly within the next six months that we have a uh, looked at the policy in terms of what do we mean by school improvement, what does it uh, what does it look like in practice, what does an effective system look like and what are the measures to determine the success of an effective system and then that kind of delivery model, how do we do that on the ground, how do you support schools, teachers, parents, communities uh, to value and support educational delivery in Northern Ireland. And in terms of the count, read, succeed piece specifically, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, and the need to prioritise, obviously, <coughs> in, the, in the current context, I think we recognise that the important first step in that is the review of statutory assessment, uh, getting establishing that baseline. Um, 
in terms of literacy and numeracy across the system to be able to help target what that count read six days successor needs to look like. But just to give you some assurance around, you know, we're not standing still while that's being done. Um, we've been doing a lot of work, um, engaging really closely with academia around literacy in particular, in terms of emerging practice from elsewhere, in terms of what the research says, and we're also feeding that very much into the special educational needs policy, for example, in terms of the approaches to dyslexia and to inform what a teacher professional learning offering would need to look like around that. So we are looking at literacy and numeracy, but we do recognise the need to review Count Read Succeed, but the important first step is establishing that baseline coming out of the review of statutory assessment. Thank you. And just the final one is the recommendation eight and it says you state in response you're taking forward a number of actions this year. Can you provide an update on those actions and whether they have been implemented or when will they be and any assessment of their impact or plans to evaluate their impact? Do you want to pick up um, in terms of attendance? Yeah, so there's, um, I suppose, the, the one which is mentioned there as a specific action has been the, the attendance uh, summit, which took place in October. And following out of that, there's been a number of actions about trying to, I suppose, capture good practice. We are aware there's a number of schools. Uh, that have really delivered innovative approaches to improve um, uh, attendance in their own school and setting. And I think in the next number of weeks, we'll be launching a bit more information about that kind of best practice approach. We are looking back at that kind of um, attendance strategy with a view uh, to sort of refresh it and, and contextualise it now in the current position post-COVID. And I think some of the priorities we would like to look at within that would be ensuring the school is a nurturing and happy environment that learners want to attend, uh, trying to tackle the issue of emotionally uh, based social um, or school avoidance, um, looking at uh, the, uh, sort of the, the service delivery model. So currently we have the educational welfare service within the EA and we do want to look at how that service becomes a more proactive early intervention model to tackle issues of attendance before they become um, harder to deal with. Uh, and we also want to, to look at um, how communities as a whole uh, support attendance. And we'll look at that through the RAISE project. Again, a holistic kind of view about how schools, parents, children and communities can work together. Because I think within attendance, we're conscious that there's OECD talks about four issues, about those four issues being a, a, a pupil issue, a school issue, a parent issue and a community issue. And we need to tackle each of them. So um, and the, the recommendation also talks about um, our central repository of good practice within the EA as well about how we tackle school attendance. But I should say we are seeing small improvements on school attendance. Certainly, if we look at April 2024, based on April 2022, we're seeing uh, small improvements. And the issue post-COVID was seen across the UK, and we are trying to respond to that as quickly as we possibly can. Listen, Mark, you've all been open and frank with your answers. And I mean, like I said, it's a slightly different committee, and it's not your regular committee. so. There was a good enough report and inquiry, and we're just trying to find it. And we're all in together trying to support, to be honest. And yeah. I want to see each individual given the best chance, and that's why we're sitting here today. But we'll, we'll work with you on it. But thank you very much for your answers. OK, okay Chair. Thank you, Thank you, uh, Cahill, uh, David Honeyford. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to take on from what Cahill says, because this is all about the the students and, and, and developing and closing the gap. But the department's taken forward a number of actions to address the PSE's uh, recommendation of learning leaders policy and the development of an implementation of the teacher professional learner uh, framework and further development of the existing EA learning and development programme. However, it doesn't and uh, you haven't indicated when each of these actions will be completed. Can you talk us through um, sort of completion date or a proposed completion date for each of them? Right. And, and thank you for, for your questions. And as we've already discussed, we see teachers as being at the absolute heart of improving outcomes for, for all our children and young people, um, and high effective teaching and learning being at the centre of, of all of that, that work. And you rightly mention the learning leaders strategy, but in terms of the priority that is being given to it, there, there are two specific work streams within the end end review and school improvement. One, which is around teacher professional learning and their development 
development and the second around curriculum support. So it's that idea of putting teaching and learning at, at the heart of the policy. Uh, and why we haven't been able to give um, discrete timelines around that is we've been we've been doing a lot of work um, coming out of the learning leader strategy um, to develop proposals. Um, that we would plan to be put into the Minister very shortly uh, around consultation in terms of the proposals around teacher professional learning, and that will include a teacher professional learning framework uh, for teachers and a learning leadership lens, um, which will include a revised set of teacher competences uh, within that, um, and we would hope to be going out to the system Obviously, post-election, we'll be putting some proposals um, to seek the views of the system and, and in particular, the teaching profession. Um, I have to say it's one of the biggest themes we would hear when we visit mm -hmm. schools um, from teachers about that real appetite there is for high-quality teacher mm -hmm. professional learning. There's also a separate stream of work through the special educational needs end end review and that's where the two reviews uh, cross over that is about um, the capacity of the workforce and how they're equipped and skilled to meet the changing needs of, of our pupil population and that's along a continuum right through from our engagement with initial teacher education through early career teaching middle management and then support for those who want to move to a leadership position. So all of those elements of the continuum will be included within the proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Just sticking on uh, sort of the pupils and coming from a bit of the kind of stuff that comes through my office, um, the reality is the pupils who have the greatest need or for the most challenging um, need or circumstances work with classroom assistance. And the vast majority of our mainstream classrooms have one or more classroom assistants as part of the, the part of their staffing. But what policies then or plans or opportunities to develop and enhance their skills and experience are are currently in place? Yeah. So um, you're quite right. Th those children um, that often have the, the greatest need um, are are assigned a classroom assistant because that that has tended to be uh, the go-to intervention in terms of specifically children with, with special educational needs and in view of that there is a particular work stream through the SEN end-to-end review which is looking at two aspects in terms of classroom assistance that's both their employment uh, and that's in terms of their their pay and their conditions but also their progression pathways and what training support and development is available to them the second is around the deployment of classroom assistance um, and how their role can both be enhanced and supported within the classroom by other practice and how schools can be supported to both use classroom assistance and a degree of other supports within the classroom to best meet the, the needs of the children. Um, so that we, we recognise there's a need for a workforce plan around classroom assistance that would look very specifically at teaching and learning for them as well. So that is something we're also engaging with the universities around. Uh, there's already some provision there in terms of training and development support for classroom classroom assistance and that's something we would want to bring forward through the end-to-end -end review as well. So that will come through that in the will review, come. yeah. And I, I just want to just to pick up, and again this is coming from stuff that I, I've got through my office, but if we're trying to close the gap and the classroom assistants are the ones that are, are dealing on a one-to-one, -one, I've had cases where our, our pupils are on a reduced day or reduced timetable, so how many of the pupils with the greatest <coughs> need or on a reduced day or reduced timetable? And I have to say that is something we don't have a figure for at the moment, but it is something we are very aware of from our engagement with schools uh, across uh, the, the system. The department don't collect that data? It, it, not currently, uh, and that is something that I know EA are looking at with schools. It is also something that, that's happening in other jurisdictions as well. Uh, there are other things called flexible timetables, they're called reduced timetables here, and there's a variety of approaches to that um, that schools take forward. Um, some schools do it in a very formalised way, 
uh, where they would have a plan to transition the child back to a full timetable. But I think it's a, uh, we would accept it's something we need to get um, a, a greater side of in terms of the actual scope and scale of that issue across it's not the a serious, system. Serious problem? Are we not? We're, we're, there's a gap appeared. Or there's a gap here. Yeah. But what is happening is the kids that are actually not able to are not producing the results are actually in school a lot less time. So if they're not, we don't know that figure. We don't have the data. So not currently. So how can you close the gap if you don't have but, the? But often those children are put on a reduced. T- there's a variety of reasons. Um, yeah. that's I don't know what the with parents were not agreeing to is what yes. I'm saying, and it, it comes down to the classroom and the teaching. So if we're trying, if the aim is to close the gap. How if they're losing thirty percent or forty percent or fifty percent of the time? And I think that's I think that's exactly why we need to give our schools greater flexibility in terms of how they respond to the needs of their children and young people. So at the minute, um, the intervention is in most cases a full time classroom assistant, and often that isn't possible or that classroom assistant isn't in place. Um, where you see the best practice is where schools have the flexibility to deploy a range of models in addition to classroom assistant support. So where they may have additional teachers or where they can provide withdrawal support or smaller group teaching, and those are exactly the types of models we are exploring through the end to end review. But that issue that you've brought to our attention is one we are working closely with the EA around in terms of identifying the scale of it. No, no, no. It's, but it, the recommend, it's on. It's around that recommendation. It is definitely around that recommendation because you're an emerging issue. It's a, it's an issue that's so you're asking. The recommendation is around training for teachers, but it's the classroom assistants in the class and the kids aren't in the class. So it, it, it it's around that. But finally, I'll just you indicate the further training and development of teachers depend on funding coming from the executive, and I appreciate that. But does that mean that some of the actions currently been taken forward may not? actually be completed or implemented? I think like so many of these things, as Mark has said, it's in a really against a really challenging budgetary context. Um, and we've consistently made the case <coughs> for sustainable and continued investment in education and teacher professional learning is one area that requires that investment. The pay is one yeah, thing, absolutely. but that continuous investment in supporting their professionalism and building their capacity is vital. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. It's just we all have a, a great passion in relation to education, and uh, you know all of us have kind of went to, the recommendations as the priority of the MOR. Um, so with, with that said, the response uh, recommendation ten, the response advises that the education authority will facilitate school leaders in the development of management skills in financial planning and effective use of resources. Uh, how and when will this be done? So I, I'd mentioned, Chair, um, the work that's being done around the proposals on the teacher professional learning framework. Separately, um, we've been working with the EA to bring forward proposals around um, the professional qualification for headship. That is around that support for those teachers who want to progress and move on to leadership positions. Um, that would be looking very specifically um, in the wording of that recommendation just around how they can be effective in leadership roles and the whole management piece. Um, and again, that would be something that would be subject to the, the funding being available to be able to roll that out and take that forward. But certainly plans are at an advanced stage in terms of the design of what such a qualification might look like. Okay. Uh, and you also advise that the Education Authority will build the capacity and challenge function of governors by ensuring that they have access to a development programme. When will they have access to, to that, and um, do they have it now, for instance? Well, there is an ongoing uh, uh, training programme and, and, and training that, that's available to governors. Um, this is one that comes up quite a lot, and um, it's one that's always quite tricky. Uh, there's there's uh, training available online, uh, and there can be individual support provided to uh, governors. Um, and we're always seeking to try and build the, the, the knowledge and expertise um, of our governors uh, to, because they play such an important role in the decision making um, and in setting the strategic direction for the uh, for the school. So th- th- there is existing uh, training there, uh, and the EA will be continuing to uh, provide that. 
Okay, uh, you know, the actions that you've outlined in terms of your response are entirely appropriate and welcomed, actually, but they're, they're, it's just not clear in relation to timescales for, for completion, and, and both answers even received there now. I'm just not clear as to what the timescales are. Well, I think part of the reason why some of the timescales aren't clear, uh, Chair, is because uh, we, we have... We have drawn together a lot of the work in this whole area around the two end end reviews that we've talked about in quite a lot of detail today, uh, which are still ongoing. Um, and they are comprehensive, as we've said before, it's right from the policy right through to the, the, what the EA and other, other ALBs do, right through to what happens in the, in the, in the schools. So there's a big programme of work and a big engagement aspect of that with practitioners and also with the, the, the uh, academic and, and, and professional advisory group that we've set up of, of professionals and, uh, and academics to help us to, to, to uh, work through these issues. Uh, and we're sweeping up a lot of these issues in that review until we get greater clarity of the outcome of that review. We're not yet in a position to move from the strategy, the broad model we want to approach to implementation. So we're not at the point where we can actually put the firm timescales uh, around that. Um, but those, those uh, reviews are well advanced. Uh, we would hope to complete them in the next matter of months would be our, our time frame. Although I suspect, to be honest, well, we, will, we will have an initial report and we will continue to work because this is the sort of thing that you go around all the time because you're going from policy to support to implementation, what happens in the cloud to policy support. That is the whole cycle of what, of what, of what we do. So um, we will be able to uh, put time frames to some of the specific actions uh, over the next matter of months. But again, this will also be dependent on uh, decisions being taken about priorities. It will be dependent on finance. It will be dependent also at times on not just additional finance, welcome and important that is. It will also be looking at how we're using existing resources and whether we need to have change in the way existing resources uh, are used uh, to make sure that what's being done is, is, is more effective. And that could involve a whole range of things. The independent review identified a whole range of potential actions that could be taken right through from uh, different uh, uh, models in the, in the classroom in terms of using teachers and classroom assistants together, uh, different models of small group te teaching and so forth, right through to structural change uh, around the, uh, some of the um, arm and bodies in education. And all of that will play into what resources are available and how we can deliver these, these uh, programmes. Um, so it's, the fact, it's not that we haven't been doing and I think that's what I want to, 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 to assure you. We have been working very hard and very extensively on these NDN reviews, which are, are, are dealing with the two big areas of special education needs and school improvement, and that will pick up, it is picking up all of these issues and will enable us to move to the point where we'll be able to give you greater clarity over the time frame. The other point I would say is that um, we are putting as much resource as we can in, into this. It is always a, a stretch, um, and uh, we will want to move to implement what we can as quickly as we can. Mm. We don't I mean, my, my intention certainly isn't that we spend a long time thinking about this and then a long time planning and a long time implementing. I want us when we identify clearly where we want to go and we're fairly clear where we want to go in, on, uh, in, in these areas and we identify early actions, we start to implement them and we'll be starting to do that implementation uh, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the very near future. In fact, in the special education needs side, we've already started some of that and we've, 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 we've highlighted some actions will be taken from September. Uh, so. I can't give you the firm time frame because we're still working on it, but they are being addressed. There is a lot of work going on, and we will be give, bringing that clarity shortly. The, the, the clarification is helpful. And like, as I've said, you know, the, the actions outlined in terms of the response from the department is, is helpful. Um, it was just our, our concern was around the time scales, and I know it's all, it's difficult. You've, you've provided some clarification in that, but even some indication in these responses of an indicative or you know potential. Uh, Level to, to or, or target that would would be would be helpful. Uh, things change indicatively. Uh, it would be helpful just so we can work towards it, and then we know things are moving or not. You know, okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Brownie. Um, thank you, Cheryl. I just want to touch on the recommendation eleven, and it's just to get some clarity around the response from yourselves and obviously the recommendation from TAC. So my question would be, the recommendation was to urgently review the current impact of the ETI and the school improvement team on improving educational attainment. So my question would be, was a review carried out as recommended? We talked about the ETI and 
Can you approach the inspection? Yeah. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you'll be aware ETI has uh, developed a new approach recently, uh, launched that, that new inspection strategy, um, and in doing so, they engage in a, an extensive process of consultation and engagement right across the system uh, in terms of what that new process would look like. Um, there's an analysis of all of those consultation responses um, that's available on the ETI uh, website. And I know that the inspectorate took a lot of time across the system engaging with schools um, and I suppose preparing the way um, for this new inspection strategy and in, in anticipation of um, the ending of action short of strike uh, and they're already out engaging in schools um, and really hitting the ground running around all of that but I know there was a lot of time taken a lot of analysis done to reach the point of the new approach to inspection certainly the feedback we have received from schools is that that's allowing a much more nuanced approach in terms of taking into account the context that a school is in in terms of its community in terms of the profile of its pupils and then how it is assessed against that and within that, that context. In terms of the school development service, um, again, uh, and apologies for repeating myself, but it's back to the end end review and school improvement. And that operational delivery model at the heart of that is looking at the work of the school development service within the education authority. Uh, as Peter referred to earlier, there's been an extensive mapping exercise of what that current landscape looks like. I have to say it's quite a busy landscape because you have the, the EA School Development Service, but there's other organisations, obviously like CCMS, SIA, who have a role to play in supporting school improvement and in this space. And so that mapping exercise has looked at the role of each of those services, the work that they currently do, and importantly, how that feels when you're in a school and at your, you're at the receiving end of all of that. And that's to inform the shape of a new delivery model going forward, looking at how can we clarify roles and responsibilities and ensure that schools are receiving the support they need when they need it and in the right way. And back to the point that I made earlier, and it's something that's come out as we've engaged through the school improvement review. It's not just about when a school reaches the stage where they've had a poor inspection report, for example, but it's how all schools can support it to be to be better, to go from good to great. And so that's the work we're currently engaged in in terms of developing that new model. So the School Development Service has been at the heart of reviewing that. Um, and the recommendation also suggested um, a review of the capacity and the, the capability of the school improvement team. Um, was was that review carried out as recommended within that, or is that a review within another well, review? That's, that's such? something. Yeah. So we're working very closely. It's a collaborative um, end to end review, um, co-chaired with myself and a senior officer in EA, and that that is an assessment that they're undertaking in terms of their own service, and in defining what a new model looks needs to look like. It also needs to be very clear on what are the capacity and the skills that will be required in that new model, and how can that best be delivered in a way that provides a high quality service but is also cost effective in its approach. And that is looking at a range of options in terms of how do we actually give maximum <coughs> flexibility and yeah. support to mm -hmm. schools, um, back to what we were talking about earlier, to, to either um, address their teacher professional learning needs or to bring in some curriculum support. So a range of models are being looked at within that, but the capacity piece is an important element of that. And just for clarity, that, that's all ongoing at the moment? That's then? all yeah. ongoing. That's, there... That initiated in February of last year. February last year. Yes. And is there a time frame then for completion of that at this stage? Yeah, well, I think you know, as, as the chair said, I suppose time skills are indicative. You know, I think there were a three-stage three, three, three stage process, so the mapping work is nearly complete, which uh, will take us to the summer. There's then option development, which will probably take us into the autumn time, and then development of policy proposals will take us to Christmas, probably. But again, that will, as Mark says, you know, there might be elements of the end of the interview. Some will speak, be, go faster than others, and if we can. Uh, deliver any kind of quick wins or early kind of actions, we'll do that. We will not wait until the final product from the review is complete, but we will try and make improvements as we go through it. But the final policy review will probably be closer to the start of 2025. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Stewart. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, just turn to recommendation 12 then, just an area in that. The expert panel estimated that the cost of implementation would rise from 10.9 million in year one to 73.1 million in year five. However, to date, only 13.7 million has been allocated to a fair start. Um, just curious to know what this has meant for implementation and has any measure, measurable progress been achieved as envisaged by the expert panel? Um, I, I think it would be fair to say it has been impacted. Um, obviously, this was a, a program endorsed by the executive. Um, it had set out an ambitious action plan um, and different to others in that it was costed. And so it had given, albeit the panel would have admitted those were indicative costings and perhaps even more on the conservative side, but the funding had not accompanied uh, that action plan. And so with a relatively modest resource um, by comparison to what had been envisaged by the panel, um, we have tried to maximise that to deliver as much as possible. But yes, we haven't been able to deliver um, the full ambition as set out in the, that first start programme just due to the funding availability. Um, I can give you a sense of what has been able yeah, be to helpful. be delivered as, yeah. a, as a result of that. Um, so we have provided um, now 9,000 uh, digital devices to around 274 schools. Um, 4.5 million has been invested uh, per annum in 62 nurture groups, um, as well as in investing in a whole school nurture approach uh, to train up schools in, in nurture provision. We have supported a Belfast-wide early years pilot, which has looked at a different way of working around early intervention for children with special educational needs and building a partnership between health and education professionals. And we'll be using the learning <coughs> from that to inform our special educational needs provision. 600 young people have been engaged through the Horizons Youth Programme uh, with a youth leadership qualification. And there has been some work done around uh, school leadership capacity, as we talked about earlier, in terms of the associate accreditation and the professional learning programme. And there's also been a modest enhancement of the SEN Early Years Inclusion Service within the Education Authority. Um, I think it's important to point to the significant additional investment the Department has been able to leverage in um, to support a key element of the First Start um, programme, which was the whole community approach to education. Um, and you'll know that the First Start panel made a recommendation around the development of a reducing educational disadvantage programme, and we've been able to secure 24 million euros for the next two years um, as a result of the shared island funding package, with the potential for an additional two years beyond that, and that is to take forward that locality-based programme as set out in the First Start panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, John. Uh, Padraig de Larga. Thank you. And my last um, two questions are in relation to recommendation 13. So um, first question is, you, you put considerable effort um, to collaborate with the wider stakeholder group um, to address issues identified within the PAC's report. So that includes reducing educational disadvantage programme and the recommendation of the expert panel. So how has the department then ensured that these arrangements are having the desired impact? Uh, yes, uh, just to start, I suppose um, the the the, the uh, program discussed in the response was, I suppose, the initial plan for the reducing educational disadvantage program back when this was uh, produced, and I suppose the design of it was through a stakeholder reference group and wide community co consultation, and that really informed, I suppose, uh, how we. Uh, just designed the policy intent of what the program will do and what will deliver um, the indicators of success that we will uh, hope to achieve whenever the program moves into implementation phase, and also how we uh, prioritise our funding, uh, which, as you talked about, the, the 24 million euro through shared islands. So that was that has shown the impact of that co-design process to help inform policy decisions, which we're now taking into place. The next phase of this work. 
now is really the co-design and implementation of it. So that work is actually beginning in the next couple of days, in the next week, following the Minister's announcement last week on the RAISE programme. So the RED programme has become the RAISE programme in, in the final uh, terminology of it. Uh, and that is, again, going out into localities that have been selected, uh, that have been identified of having the greatest area of need, working with schools, community groups, employers, families, parents, other representatives within the community to identify what um, requirements they have, what kind of uh, what is the evidence need within that locality, and then develop evidence-informed projects that can then tackle the, both the educational gap but also deliver wider educational and other uh, societal outcomes in terms of health justice, economic activity and things like that. So the the engagement so far has informed the policy intent and the programme design and the next stage is further co-design work to really uh, inform the implementation of it. Okay. How do you measure success then? Well, I suppose it goes back to, again, we'll have to have a broad range of measurements of success. You know, the programme, as announced by the Minister, takes the lens of every child happy, every child learning, every child succeeding, and within that we'll have a number of measurements that might set that out, and that might link to school attendance, it might link to attainment, it might link to uh, antisocial behaviour within the area, it might link to post-16 pathways, so within happy, learning, succeeding, we'll look at a number of different indicators of success, basically, but within each locality, the interventions will be different depending on what is required, and we need to build in a sort of robust evaluation framework to determine the, how the funding has been spent and what lessons can be learned in terms of policy and delivery uh, for wider education purposes. So um, there will be a range of sort of uh, policy measure, uh, measures of success which will be built into the programme at a locality level also. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I'd be keen to actually get the list of your success criteria. Um, I think that'd be really useful for us as a committee to be able to assess how, you, how that process is carried out, if that's okay. Yeah, and certainly we're working on sort of an evaluation framework currently on how the programme will both be evaluated at a system level across the 15 localities, and then it might vary depending on a locality approach, depending on what the intervention is put in place, but we can certainly provide some early thoughts on what that might look like in terms of the indicator success and probably update then as the programme develops. Good stuff, thank you. Um, just final question, you'll be glad to hear, I'm sure, at this stage. Um, the recommendation was something that should be established to take forward the recommendations in the PEC report. Um, so it's not really clear if the recommendations are included within the remits of the structure described. So can you confirm that that is the case and that the recommendations of the PAC are being discussed? It's something we are looking at at the minute. So we do have, they're being discussed across a, a range of mechanisms, but we're, we're currently reviewing those structures at the moment, in particular our First Start Programme Board, because I think we accept it's about more than assessing where we are against that list of actions. And it's important we're looking at these issues around the attainment gap in their broadest sense. And so we're reviewing those structures currently and we'll ensure that the recommendations are being picked up through that. Yeah, perfect. No, that's great. Thank you very much for all your answers today. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Mark, Peter and Lindsay. Uh, the CNAG briefly may have a comment or may not. Are you okay, Doreen? <laughs> Stuart? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for being with us for the last few hours and enduring quite a lengthy uh, number of questions. We do appreciate the answers, the directness and the honesty uh, as well, and of course your patience. Um, we would rather we didn't have to bring people back before the committee, uh, and I hope going forward that when we're looking for an update, it's as succinct but as direct and as honest and open as can be, and uh, maybe we, we wouldn't have to, to do, do this, but we appreciate it very much, so thank you uh, for being with us. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank, thank you sure. to the committee, committee as well for a, a very positive session. Thank you. Oh, well, just another day, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. a longer discussion. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. When we go on to close, or now? Right. Okay.
away. Members, uh, thanks very much for uh, that. Uh, obviously, we had a heavier load in terms of questioning today because we're a few members late, but uh, it is appreciated and uh, important, actually, uh, to show that this committee takes its work seriously and will be following up uh, with relevant departments if we are not satisfied with the responses that they provide this committee. Uh, so I think that was a worthwhile session. We have run over time, so I think it's a, a fairly... Uh, important proposal to ask or request to ask if we could postpone the child poverty element of today's agenda to next week, do it alongside other relevant items. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thanks very much, uh, members. Um, can we also seek an agreement to update the Education Committee following today's session? Mm -hmm. Okay, and can I uh, thank Dorina and the team as well, as always, for uh, their uh, support and guidance with these uh, things, and also to Stuart and Julie, who's just left from the TOA. Okay, members, we're now going to close session to consider the draft report on mental health services in Northern Ireland. And if the. Committee Room 30, signed.